Good afternoon. The title of this panel discussion is written with a question mark at the end. Uh, so we can assume that that implies that not all elites everywhere are losing their electorate, uh, but that the electorate is indeed a very fickle creature, which today is very quite happy to vote for people in parties who promise to drain the swamp, uh, uh, for people in parties who rail against the establishment uh, and the establishment's so-called self-serving and self-dealing ways. The rise of populism and the future of democracy and the future of Europe, you know, this is a much discussed topic. And in order to make it just a tad more manageable, perhaps we can focus on three interrelated aspects of this issue. F firstly, there is the larger zeitgeist issue of the death of expertise itself, where rejecting expert advice or guidance is but a way of asserting one's independence against those nefarious elites. Yesterday, Defense Minister Pabrix, he had a, a very nifty little quip. Uh, he said that uh, nowadays everybody is a writer, but uh, we don't have so many readers anymore. Well, you know, we could continue along in this line and say, for instance, there are no more referees. There are only players. And what does this mean for the future of democracy when there are no referees, just players? Unlike during the Cold War, today the aim is not to convince you of the superiority of one system over the other. The aim is to confuse and confound and to declare that everything is equal. That is equally corrupt and meaningless. Secondly, next to the overarching zeitgeist issue of the uh, end of expertise or the ideal of expertise. Secondly, there's the issue alluded to by Donald Tusk in his speech in Athens just a couple of days ago, when he said that the greatest challenge of our times is, and I quote, how to make politics what it once was, acting and thinking for the common good, end of quote, from Donald Tusk. Why is it that no one uh, assumes, or no longer assumes, that power is being used in a way to benefit the public interest, the common good. This suggests, of course, that it's not only the fickle electorate's fault when they choose to rail up against the establishment. And lastly, what does all of this mean and what effect does it have on the European Union? which for many political parties is the perfect, absolutely perfect boogeyman. It's the one that opens up the door to strangers in your backyard. The EU is by design a citadel of expertise and in an age of the end of the ideal of expertise, what do you do about that if you're considered a citadel of expertise? At a time when the EU needs to be particularly active on many fronts, does the populist influence at the national and EU level paralyze the EU on the international scene? Well, to discuss these and perhaps other issues, we have four esteemed panelists. To my far right, President Vajrovike Freiberger, President of the Republic of Latvia from 1999 to 2007 and currently Pres uh, president of the Club of Madrid. Next to her, we have Dr. Andreas Norlin, speaker of the Riksdag, who's had an intensive couple of days here in uh, Latvia, but we're very happy you could join us on this panel. And you know, Speaker Norlin, I was especially pleased uh, to see that um, you seem to have written your doctoral thesis on the topic of unreasonableness, uh, which seems to be very, <laughs> very apropos for our the panel discussion uh, today. Uh, 
Next is uh, Mr. Arseni Yatsenuk, uh, Ambassador Yatsenuk, former Prime Minister of uh, Ukraine and since 2014 the leader of the People's Front political party in Ukraine, is that correct? There and next to me Dr. Konstanze Stelzenmüller, uh, currently Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, on leave from the Library of Congress where she's the Kissinger Chair on Foreign Policy and International Relations. Okay, so all of these three issues I raised, they bleed into one another, but please feel free to address them all individually or something completely different that comes to your mind um, that you might find more pertinent insofar as the loss of trust in elites and the loss of credibility for elites is concerned uh, and how this all affects Europe. And President Freiberg, as the former vice chair of the Reflection Group on the Future of Europe. I think you've been thinking about these things for very, very many years. Um, so if you do not mind, I will give you the floor first uh, to answer some of these issues or just uh, to give a perspective uh, that you certainly have from the inside. Thank you, Madam Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, spending two years of my life uh, getting up at ungodly hours and flying to Brussels for two days of intensive uh, debate uh, from colleagues from across Europe. Not one from every country, that was the intention uh, of uh, Monsieur Sarkozy, actually, who had conceived of having uh, such a body. and. Uh, we presented, Julia, our uh, conclusions in 2009, and as, as ever with attempts to look into the future, uh, we might as well have been looking in a crystal ball uh, and probably have uh, the same um, level of accuracy in our predictions uh, as we did with all these two years of reflecting. Uh, uh, in one word, uh, the French are right, and they're saying plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, truly, things are constantly changing. And they're changing um, uh, not just in a way that brings us back to point zero, no. Um, uh, they are changing in ways that we, are, uh, we have difficulty perceiving in what way they are actually changing. And this is why futurology and, and, and reflecting about the future, uh, of course we have to do planning. Businessmen will tell you that unless you plan in your business, you're in deep trouble. Uh, so that obviously in politics, uh, uh, it should not uh, be anything unusual to look into the future. But truly, uh, we have to accept that the world is changing and it's changing at an ever increasing uh, speed. This is the thing, uh, that if we had a sort of arithmetically progressing curve of changes going on in the world, I think it has definitely changed to a geometric progression. Uh, the change seems to be accelerating, and every new stage uh, in development uh, changes the level playing ground, which is no longer level. It is a different playing ground, and you're, st you're starting to play. You have to look for new rules, or the new rules simply impose themselves on you. In the, in the task given to us as a, as a panel, uh, may I start by simply reflecting, uh, since uh, we're on the theme, uh, on some of the key definitions. Uh, Donald Tusk uh, was very optimistic when he said that we would like to have a politics that answers to the needs uh, of the people as it did before. Um, I find that extraordinarily idealistic uh, in its formulation because when I look back uh, with a critical eye uh, on the past, either immediate past, medium term or long term past, Frankly, uh, I do not see, uh, even armed with my best glasses, uh, the, the age of golden, golden justice and golden politics uh, 
uh, that Mr. Tusk seems to be talking about. It makes me think of the ancient Greek myth about, you know, an, a past golden age when mankind were simply better built. Uh, they were a better kind of people. They had better moral values. They had better commitments. They had responsibilities. They were better people. And then came the age of silver, and then came the age of gold. And Hindu myths have a similar concept about the kalpas, uh, which have increasingly um, uh, deteriorating. Uh, and yes, and we are in the Kali Yuga, if you must know. So that is, uh, that is the worst of the lot. Uh, so what can we expect? Well, I think we can, we can expect to keep fighting even in a Kali Yuga or, or even in, in an age that is not a golden age. Uh, then the thought that there was a, a golden age when we had elitist parties, I suppose benevolent uh, elites uh, looking after us, uh, and, uh, and seeing uh, to justice and, and, and comfort and, uh, and quality of life. But the only ones that I know of were totalitarian, bloodthirsty regimes who presented that as their program and did in real life the absolute very contrary. As far as the concept of elites, uh, it seems to me that with the French Revolution, uh, the major intent of the French Revolution was to do away with the concept that some people by birth belong to, as it were, a different species of humanity, uh, notably the aristocracy on the one hand, and that is the blood uh, inheritance of, of uh, inherent, inherited rights, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the God-given privileges of the church. And I think that even after the French Revolution, um, Umberto Eco, uh, in his novel, The Prague Cemetery, which I recommend warmly to, to anybody, uh, describes in the 19th century uh, how the concept of privilege, of justice, of right, uh, and of governance were sort of bubbling away in, uh, in a cauldron of... Uh, conflicts, discontents, uh, claims, counterclaims, pretensions. They were what, what he called the throne, defenders of the throne and the altar. In other words, the conservative parties, which we, to this day, or until recently, knew in Europe as the right. And then slowly, towards the end of the century, what used to be the claims for liberté, égalité, and fraternité of the French Revolution, bloody as it was, it was meant to do away with undue privilege and to give every citizen the same rights from birth uh, as any other. And that is a, a huge step uh, in a <coughs> conceptual um, uh, way of looking at, uh, at society and how it is composed. Um, by the way, talking about the blood privileges, in the 19th century, Kleist had a very famous uh, play in the Germanic-speaking uh, countries, Das Kätchen von Heilbronn. Again, for those who read German, I very much recommend it, because there, in a very dramatic way, we see how deeply anchored was the concept of blue blood, in other words, aristocratic blood, even a drop of it, even illegitimate, uh, even coming from the left side of the blanket. Having a drop of blue blood immediately put you in a different category. In other words, you were privileged. But uh, do we have in Europe parties that represent the aristocracy? We do have uh, constitutional monarchies, our neighbors have a constitutional monarchy, we have others elsewhere, but their concepts of governments are not blamed, um, um, based on the superiority of the blue-blooded, but rather uh, on uh, a concept where every citizen is a participant in what is a democratic process. So that constitutional monarchies have, if you'll forgive me, will have a monarchy that represents uh, in, in, in an almost decorative way the values, embodies the values, uh, the conservative values of a society and what it stands for and the respect for the history 
uh, of that country of which it is proud, but do not enter into contradiction uh, with the values uh, of equality that democracy is built on. Uh, the 19th century saw, after the French Revolution and its concept of equality, Marxism rising up as, as again saying that the claims of the people had not been sufficiently answered after the French Revolution, therefore another revolution was necessary. However, if the French Revolution cut the heads of aristocrats, even people like Lavoisier who had, and, and others who were actually true democrats and wonderful scientists and, and had never uh, hurt a fly, uh, the, the Stalinist concept of totalitarianism, or if you like, egalitarianism in the name of communism, was to terrify everybody equally. Stalin had a, was a genius in that sense. He, instituted a system where nobody, even the most convinced Bolshevik and participant in the Bolshevik revolution, was in no way uh, assured of survival, never mind of making a career in that so concept. He instituted total unpredictability. He would chop off heads right and left completely at random. And in fact, the old Bolsheviks were among the first to go, including the 12,000 Latvians that, that were killed in, in, in 1937 on the outskirts of Leningrad. Uh, so that, that is, but the left and the Marxist ideas, in spite of all this, spread in Western Europe and until, well, until yesterday, until today, we still have the right and the left. You open a newspaper in Paris, and the newspaper still, there will be a left pay newspaper and a right paper. You go to Denmark, and you have a party that is called Fenstra. And if I, am, I don't know Danish, but I think that means left. Uh, and the division between left and right, I do not think it's a division representing elites. It is a division um, based on, on tradition, on inertia, uh, on, uh, on habit, uh, on uh, circumstances that frequently have randomly developed as they have on, uh, through the randomness of history. But what we have as populism today, I think is another wave of the general population feeling left behind, but most of all, an element that has not been touched upon either by the left or by the right before, and that is the theme of identity, of cultural identity, of linguistic identity, uh, and uh, of uh, uh, sort of regional identification and systems of value that are linked to that identity, uh, ethnic or, or religious or otherwise, uh, which have always been in the background in the earlier historical developments, but now have come to the fore. And these are linked at the same time in a way that you might say is, is both logical and illogical to the economic conditions of people. I had two occasions to, to go to um, the former uh, East Germany uh, la during the last year, to Magdeburg uh, and to, uh, in, in South, South, South Saxony uh, and in Gotha uh, in Thuringen. Uh, and what I heard there was a discontent among the population uh, and a concern uh, about the far-right parties um, and the xenophobic parties arising but at the same time, a concern about what was happening in these lenders uh, which had not managed to catch up to Western Germany, after all, 50 years behind the Iron Curtain has left deep marks. Uh, Latvia is not as rich as Denmark or as Sweden, even though years have passed since 1991. Uh, and neither, it turns out, is Thuringen uh, or Mecklenburg or, 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 or Saxony. Uh, in spite of the, uh, the resources and the enormous efforts that Western Germany has been putting in equalizing. There are people there who economically feel left behind, as we have people here. There are people from these regions who emigrate in large numbers. Uh, Germany is fortunate in that it has a rich part, so that that is where they emigrate too, whereas our people emigrate elsewhere and outside of our country, and it is a more serious loss to us. But even in East Germany, the, uh, the, the impression I got is that there 
are people who feel that the economic development, the perspectives for the future are threatened. And secondly, uh, that they are being, uh, even though as uh, they rejoice in the fact of being able to travel freely uh, and of having democracy, that joy, as it were, or that acquisition and that positive uh, feeling is overcome by the lack of economic perspective about uh, the feeling that their children and grandchildren uh, cannot necessarily look forward to a much better life than they had, uh, and uh, a feeling of their identity being threatened. So that what is now arising, uh, I am uh, in a way feeling that it's, these are Revendication, how do you call them? Claims and, 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 uh, and demands uh, that large sectors of the population are, are, are presenting uh, because of, it is not just the winter of discontent. Uh, these are the years of discontent in many parts. And politicians, whether elitist or not elitist, whether from the right or from the left, unless they respond to these uh, needs and to these wishes and these demands from the population, are going to see uh, competition uh, arising where what is being offered, of course, is uh, a fool's gold uh, rather than the real thing uh, in political terms, claiming to answer to the needs of these populations, but in fact, simply uh, fomenting uh, xenophobia, hatred, suspicion, uh, fear, uh, and so on and so on. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Freiberger, for this very good grounding, uh, historical and otherwise, in some of our uh, key concepts that we're looking at. Uh, before I give the floor to Speaker uh, Norlin, I'd like to bounce off of something that President uh, Freiberg has said at the very beginning, which is she put a big question mark uh, next to Donald Tusk's uh, assertion uh, that there was ever an age back then uh, when politics was more about the common good and the public interest. Uh, that that is uh, an illusion, if I understood you correctly, that there has never been uh, a better age. Uh, that uh, thinking about the public interest and the common good uh, was always uh, uh, a difficult uh, uh, issue. Do you three panelists, anybody agree with that or disagree with that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, please, Speaker. Well, I, I would say that I'm perhaps a bit more idealistic then, because I, I do think, and that is my impression, that um, almost all members of the Swedish parliament, and I believe many parliaments around the world, are actually deeply committed to doing good deeds and mm -hmm. trying to promote policies which they believe are are <coughs> beneficial for the population and for the country as such. I think in in Sweden and in many other countries that relatively few people enter politics out of darker motives, uh, then I do agree that we shouldn't uh, idolize history, mm -hmm. that uh, things are, uh, because that, is, that can also be a dangerous narrative that things were so much better before. I would say in many respects things, has, uh, things have never been as good as they are today uh, when it comes to science and uh, poverty and, and many other issues. Okay. The world is, is a much better place than it used to be. Okay, so you agree with it. Uh, Dr. Steinmuller, do you agree that there's never been uh, an age when the public interest was uh, kept more in mind uh, by politicians than it is today? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I think that uh, I agree with Mr. Nguyen that I've met actually a lot of very dedicated and honorable politicians and policymakers, and I have immense respect for that uh, because the public service has become discredited as a profession, and in my view, somewhat unjustly. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think that conditions today for 
performing public services, whether it's in the civil service or in politics, have become more difficult than ever. Mm -hmm. um, but let me leave why for, okay, for your it's my turn. <laughs> okay, so. Um, do you have anything to add, Mr. Yasenik, to that? Do you agree, disagree with Mr. Uh, Tusk and uh, Mrs. Freiberger's uh, comment? How could I disagree with the president of the European Council? <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely the correct answer here in Riga. You know, here is the thing. If, uh? if we believe that politicians can make every single human being in this world happy, that's not true. <laughs> and this is not the job of the politician. We need to stick to our values, to do what we believe is right, and then people will judge us. I believe that at the next round of our discussion, we will discuss the judgments, what really the implications of populism or anti-populism. So, in my humble opinion, if you do your job rightly, and politics is a job, it's a profession, you have to be smart, you have to be educated, you need to get an experience, mm -hmm. like the doctor, like the physician, like someone else, if, if you want to get the result. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I believe that in any case, if you have good intentions, and politicians have to get good intentions, he has to be um, uh, justified uh, in a proper manner. Okay, thank you. Um, I perhaps... I was thinking of the American example where I feel very keenly uh, that in the 50s and the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, politicians were very much more aware of the public interest uh, than they are today. But please, let's hear about the Swedish uh, case and your comments on the Swedish case. Uh, Speaker Norland, we'd be pleased to hear about that. Huh? Well, thank you, and I'm, I'm honored to have this opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to share some perspective from the Swedish parliament and also perhaps some comments on with a more broader outlook. Um, but though I am a humble man, uh, I have to confess that I have, in a way, become historic in my country. Uh, because in Sweden, it's the speaker who, uh, and not the head of state, who leads the process of forming a government after an election. Uh, and um, Sweden had elections in September uh, 2018. And um, I had the somewhat, uh, during that process which I led after the election, I had the somewhat dubious honor to be the first speaker ever to see my proposal for prime minister be voted down by parliament. Uh, and not only <laughs> once, but twice, actually. Uh, so uh, that's my claim to fame. Uh, and then a prime minister <laughs> yes. was, was elected on the third attempt uh, in, in January. So it, uh, the, uh, the process of forming a government uh, lasted for 134 days, four and a half months. Uh, which is a fairly long time. It's a very long time in, in the Swedish context. We are used to, to brief uh, government formation processes of a few days, perhaps, uh, in, in the past. Uh, but it's also rather long in the European perspective. It's uh, actually one, this process was one of the 4% of most long-standing processes of forming a government in Western Europe after 1945. Uh, so, uh, of course, our friends in, in Belgium still, uh, still lead this, uh, uh, this, this competition, which I'm thankful of. Uh, but we, we are among the 4% with the longest processes. And the main reason for, uh, for this, why it took so long, uh, is uh, sometimes perhaps referred to as the, a new political landscape or something like that. But um, in Sweden, we, are, we were used to, uh, to a system where one center-right bloc, dominated by the moderate party, the Swedish conservatives, competed with, with a center-left bloc dominated by the social democrats. And that is not fully the case anymore, because in... Uh, in 2010, a new party entered parliament, the Sweden Democrats, uh, and uh, since then, uh, none of the traditional two blocs have, have been able to, to reach a majority of the seats in the elections thereafter. Uh, so, um, but in the election, uh, after the elections of 2010 and 2014, uh, the traditional parties 
acted in a way so that this new situation uh, wasn't really put to a test. Uh, so we had traditional, first a centre-right government and then a centre-left government, uh, because uh, the two blocs, uh, you could say, agreed that that was the way they wanted it. So the bigger of the blocs uh, ruled the country. But after the election of 2018, that uh, approach wasn't sustainable any longer, so for the first time this new situation uh, really affected the process of forming a government and that's why it took so long, uh, because the parties did have to reposition themselves, they had to reconsider old, old allegiances and uh, this took a while. Uh, one could say, as I did many times, that they should have been better prepared for this uh, before the election. Uh, they weren't, and uh, I have, uh, I can understand why. But um, in any case, that meant that it we needed at least three months of preludes before any real negotiations could could start between the parties to try to form a government. Um, so. This is, I, I guess, one example of the shifting uh, political structures in, in Europe. Um, I, I'd like to stress that uh, al although uh, there were political uncertainty, uh, the process also showed that Sweden has the stable democratic institutions because um, the authorities kept on working as they should. Uh, Parliament did decide on a budget according to the budget law uh, and there were no protests in the streets. Uh, there, were instead a great I there was instead a great interest from the public regarding this process, which I found very encouraging that so many people really cared cared about how the process was organized uh, to form their government. Uh, so that was, uh, I, I quoted a couple of times Charles Dickens, uh, you know, a tale of two cities. Uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was, of course, in a sense, the worst of times because it was very complicated and very many uh, problems. But it was the best of times in the sense that so many people did care and uh, watched <coughs> the process and wanted to know more about how government function, how parliament function functions, what the role of the speaker is and all of that. And that I thought was encouraging. And, and we do still have a very high uh, participation rate in, in uh, elections. We, have, uh, we had 87% of the electorate voting in the last elections. I think that in an international context is very, very high. Uh, and that shows that, that is one illustration, I believe, that there is still a great amount of trust in, in the democratic institutions of Sweden. Uh, it's still relatively high. The highest of the public institutions uh, the, the one of the public institutions with the highest trust, according to, to polls, is actually the alcohol retailing monopoly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I really wouldn't want to analyze that any further. So they actually beat Parliament. But um, um, uh, I, uh, there is, on the other hand, of course, as in many countries, a part of the population uh, with significantly less trust in the institutions and in the traditional media and other such, uh, such institutions uh, than the overall population has. Um, and there is also, uh, to, to, to link to what the president just said, uh, there is also in Sweden in some groups uh, a feeling of being left out or left behind geographically, the conflict between uh, the countryside and the cities, the capital and the rest of the country. Uh, it can be socially, uh, jobs have been lost in some regions, recreated in other parts of the economy, but not to the benefit perhaps of the people who lost the jobs originally. Uh, and also perhaps politically that they feel that they don't have a say or an influence. And uh, so that those feelings exist also in Sweden. Um, and uh, uh, I would also say uh, that there has, uh, for at least 15 or 20 years, been uh, a group of, uh, in the population, a rather large group, critical towards uh, the migration and integration policy which has been pursued by, by various governments over the years. Um, you, could see, you can see that in the polls if you go back uh, 15 or 20 years, that there is a segment of the population critical towards migration and immigration. Uh, in the, and, uh, uh, but no party uh, had policies or messages targeting those attitudes, that segment of the population, if you will, uh, until this new party started to get traction. Uh, so I think 
there are several reasons for the emergence of new parties, and I believe I have identified some of them uh, like this. Uh, but I, I would also like to uh, agree with the president that if there are real or perceived problems uh, which are not addressed by the traditional parties, uh, then you run a risk that somebody else tries to formulate answers to them and address that segment of the population and address those problems. Um, you can see that uh, not only in democracies, but also in other countries, like uh, I believe Hezbollah, the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon, uh, a weak, rather weak uh, state, uh, provides social services to the population instead of the government and thereby gaining support. Uh, so it's, uh, I think that is a general uh, phenomena that if you have uh, problems which are not addressed, then somebody at some point will address them uh, and may gain support for do doing so. Uh, and uh, I would also like to, to add to this, of course, what we discussed yesterday about digital disinforma disinformation campaigns, that uh, in some countries, uh, perhaps not primarily Sweden, but in other countries where with these kinds of um, uh, situations, uh, you can also be targeted by digital disinformation campaigns to, to enhance uh, these kinds of uh, feeling among the population and, and to enhance these conflicts and, and f perceptions. Um, so uh, that is a new, uh, relatively new threat, but uh, also has to be taken into account in this context, I believe. And lastly, um, I would like to mention this new, uh, there, there's been among, I think, um, scientists a discussion about that the, uh, the left and right perspective of politics has been uh, not replaced, but perhaps uh, there has been another dimension added, what I believe is known as uh, GAL and TAN, uh, uh, the green alternative uh, and libertarian perspective, uh, standing against traditional authoritarian nationalistic perspective. Uh, is because left and right uh, is often about economic issues, economic policy, uh, and this, uh, this new perspective, is argue, it is argued, addresses cultural and social issues in, in another sense. Uh, I would say that I think there is some truth to that. On the other hand, I think also the traditional parties have been moving on that scale as well, uh, but perhaps not emphasized them enough. And to be, uh, to be quite frank, uh, a few years ago, I think almost all Swedish parties were moving very uh, in, the, in the GAL area of policy. And perhaps by that, they didn't cover the TAN flank, the more traditional nationalistic uh, perspective of culture and other issues. And, and that left them kind of vulnerable to new political forces. Uh, and I think the same can be said of, of uh, several other countries. So that's some, some reflections on the current situation. Thank you very much for these reflections. Um, as we see in Sweden, there seems to be still a great trust in institutions, a great trust in politics, despite the recent difficulties in forming, uh, forming a government uh, uh, in Sweden. So maybe we can go from Sweden to uh, what is the situation in Ukraine? Uh, Mr. Yatsenuk, perhaps you can uh, elucidate the situation for us. No, from my political perspective, it's not always bad not to have the government. And that's what people <laughs> share. <laughs> uh, let me put it this way. So, we started to discuss the fight between elites and the people, which I strongly reject. This is the fight between populism and anti-populism. We are on the different sides of the aisle. You know, uh, some people say that the elites are losing the ground due to the lack of the communication with, with the people. So I will try to change the way I communicate and I will tell you my personal story or my personal narrative, like in AA group uh, uh, or uh, political uh, psychological group. So I used to be the prime minister. No longer. <laughs> I did this job twice. 
And I was a very staunch and strong anti-populist. And I was rewarded with this. I can tell you it for sure. I have the highest rating in my country. Negative. <laughs> <laughs> and here is the thing. So we, we need to define or to choose what kind of actions we are ready to undertake. It's all about the decisions, for example. This, this is to be smart or stupid decision. Smart decision is on the side of anti-populist. Stupid decision is how to grab the swath of electorate as quick as possible. And this is inefficient decision in the long term, but in the short run, they grab the majority. Whether this is professional folks sitting in the parliament or in the house, or just unprofessional, lip service, promising everything to everybody. Whether this party or anti-populists, whether they have ideology, and yes, we do, or whether populists have any kind of ideology, yes, they do, bread and butter. This is the only, this is the only ideology they sell to the voters. This movement is extremely dangerous in the world because populists, what they are doing, they try to sell to the voters quick, fast track and easy decisions. It's like with the disease. You got the disease, okay? And you go to the surgeon and the surgeon says, I define the problem we need to undergo the surgery in order to heal and in order to make you healthy. Then you go to another doctor and he says, forget about this. He's a bad guy. He wants to take your money. I have a magic pill. It's opioid. Take it. And you're going to be free of any kind of pain. So anti-populists, they act as surgeons. Because we want to save the human being, the nation, and the country. And we pay the price. Populists, they don't care about the future. They are perfect in selling all this stuff. So a new type of communication. Because uh, uh, we've been discussing whether we have the new world. We have the same world, dear ladies and gentlemen. The same world, the same people the same hopes of the people, the same needs of the people. But what we have different, we have different types of communications. We have a new type of innovations and technologies, which we, we are not used to as, as a conventional politicians. So what is at stake today? For us not to lose, not our polit political destiny or future, it's nothing. Not to lose the countries, the state and the nations. Three pillars. The first one is information. We have to figure out how to cope with this. We need to be one step forward in communicating to the people, in delivering our message, in selling this message, in trying the way how to convince them. The second is education. If people are not educated, it's so easy to manipulate them. And what Madam President said, that's what Soviets did too. If you have poor and not educated people, it's easy to sell any stuff to them. And the third issue, which is opportunities. And this is the job of the politicians, to provide the opportunities for every single human being in your home state. And in this case, you will not give any ground to populists or no doubt that they can win in a short run. And look what's happening in the world right now. This, it's a disaster, okay? This is a shockwave of populism. But the time will come when people will realize that this is not the solution for them. The time will come when, we're gonna, when we will stem the tide or even reverse the tide. And we have to be ready to fight for our values to stand our ground. Notwithstanding your approval ratings or disapproval ratings, you have to believe in what you are doing. And this is the only way how to achieve the result.
I don't care about the popularity ratings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for these uh, very heartfelt uh, um, comments. Uh, but there will be some people that say that, yes, uh, people uh, are not necessarily the same anymore precisely because of the new technology. But that's an entirely different uh, uh, issue. Dr. Stelzenmüller, uh, we would be very pleased to hear your comments maybe on the German situation or sure. on the wider situation. All right. Well, first off, thank you very much to the organizers of the conference for inviting me uh, to speak here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back in Riga, regardless of the weather. Um, it's a wonderful city. Um, I would also like to say that I also wrote a doctoral thesis on direct democracy in America, so I <laughs> consider myself something of an expert. And of course, I reject the rejection of experts. Yeah. Um, that goes with the territory. Now, on your question of why, why do people support the populists, um, I think there is a... It's, it's certainly distressing to watch for me as a German currently living in Washington. And by the way, it's the other way around. I'm on leave from Brookings oh, at okay. the Library Sorry of Congress. <laughs> um, it's been incredibly distressing for me to watch uh, how the populists and the ethno-chauvinists and nativists have gained traction throughout the West. Uh, whether that's in America, whether it's in the, in the UK where I spent my childhood, or in my own country, Germany. Um, and. It is particularly distressing for me, given Germany's history, that we now have a party that is not just hard right, but has actual neo-Nazis in its, in its midst. And that has been ra radicalizing uh, to the point of extreme clarity, I would say, in recent months. <coughs> so let me, let me go through a couple of things which I think explain the, the support for populists. And I think it's important to not generalize here. I think that these things are actually different in different Western democratic cultures. There is a decline for a decline of support for representative democracy, which we which in itself bears examination. There is a disintegration of trust and belief in the validity of institutions from the what President Trump calls the deep state and which I think the rest of us would just call the civil service. Um, the, well, of course, yes. <laughs> the deep state is an expression from Turkish political history and the fact that a president of the United States is calling is using that term to apostrophize his own civil service is not just shocking, it's insulting. And I think we should call it out as that. It's a term we should never use. Then there is, of course, a disrespect for the courts. Uh, we have seen that both in, uh, in America and in the UK, and, a, and, and disrespect for the legislature, again, We've seen it in the way President Trump treats, con uh, treats Congress, but also in the way that Boris Johnson and his government have been treating Parliament. Again, these are the two oldest democracies in the West, minus Switzerland. And if I may be personal here for a moment, my father, who was a 17-year-old POW in 1945, because he swam the Elbe in order to not become a Russian POW at 17, um, always told me that if we could always trust the Americans and the Brits to never do the kind of stupid shit the, and commit the kind of horrific crimes that Germany did under Nazi rule. And I'm, I'm glad that my father's no longer alive to see this. Um, I think it would have shocked him deeply. Now, I think another as aspect that has had a tremendously damaging impact on the way that normal citizens view the state was, of course, the global financial crisis, which in Europe morphed into a Eurozone pr crisis that took a lot longer to deal with and was a lot more painful. And it, I think it is that undercut the trust in and validity, not just of the international financial institutions, but also of the technocrats that work in them, and the politicians that were administering austerity recipes across the West. 
And of course, Germany, I have to say, was, was a culprit in this, uh, in, in this respect. Christian Schmidt may disagree with me, but I think we will probably agree that Germany made itself few friends with the way it treated Greece and, and other European nations under, with its very strict austerity prescriptions, whatever you may think of them on substance. Then technology has already been mentioned. I think we, we can all see that social media, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter or other, or other channels, have become a plebiscite de tous les jours, a daily referendum, in fact, an hourly minute-by-minute minute minute referendum on the performance of representative democracy, its institutions and its representatives. And we can see politicians and policymakers struggling with that struggling with retaining control over the narrative and struggling to meet the demands of citizens who expect, unreasonably we may think, but still they expect immediate responses. Then the two, the two main reasons that have also been mentioned here already by, by the president, uh, economic reasons and, and cultural reasons, again, you have to, these vary culture by culture. I think that in America and the UK, and I would add France to that, economic reasons, particularly in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, have played a greater role than in my own country, and I'll explain in a moment why, but you can see in America, in the UK, a virulent form of, of economic inequality that is translating into political inequality. In the UK and in France, an additional element here is the discrepancy between a wealthy capital and disadvantaged regional peripheries. That also plays into, the kind of, uh, into this visceral response to populist recipes. Now, of course, Germany is, is, the, is the odd man out here because while our growth is slowing right now, while we clearly have an innovation and infrastructure problem, we have had practically full employment, we've had tremendous growth. I mean, nobody in Germany can really complain about being, about being dis disadvantaged. I mean, I'm not saying we don't have poverty, I'm don't, not saying we don't have inequality, but not in the way that you can see elsewhere across the rest. And if you look at surveys, opinion polls of AFD voters in Germany, even the AFD voters will say, I'm actually f fairly happy with how I'm doing personally, financially. Yeah. So the president was right in saying that the narrative of the populists in Germany is a different one, and it's about, it's about identity, it's about culture, it's about things like immigration. And the bizarre thing about, about all this is that it's, I would say, it's partially true. There, in other words, parts of the grievances that are being aired by, by, by citizens and by voters for the AFD are legitimate. Partly, I would say, they're illegitimate. Some of them are real and some of them are imaginary. The, and let me make a brief return back to economic factors. I, I said just now that economics aren't really the reason for, economic, for, for grievances um, of voters in Germany, but I will make one exception for Eastern voters, and it's this. Uh, and, I, and I was a young journalist covering this kind of story in the early 90s, right after reunification, and I would, my, my daily paper in Berlin would send me to hunger strikes uh, in Brandenburg or in Thuringia, and I remember being showing, shown around these, these factory sites, and, and some of them were like movie sets from right after the war, or from, in fact, from, from the 1900s. In other words, the, the economic transformation that w was undertaken by the Germans by after, after 1989 and, and reunification, which involved transfers of huge sums, did I mean, it was met by an, by an East German economy that was basically non-viable in a globalized world. There were the, 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 the companies, the East German companies that, that were viable, that were producing Western quality goods, you could count on the fingers of one hand, and the rest were not. But I would also say that the, the ruthlessness with which this transformation was managed by Western German policymakers and by the Treuhandanstalt, I think discounted the enormous personal and social cost 
that this, economic, this necessary economic transformation had on many East Germans. And while I think a lot of them ended up being better off than they were in the GDR, they felt that their skills, their experience were, were disrespected and that their life experience so far was being treated as worthless. And this is the kind of thing that does translate into political attitudes. On the cultural front, I will say though, the things, the picture is a little more problematic. You will all have heard about the attack on the synagogue in Halle a couple of days ago, a really horrific event, uh, a disaster that was averted because the door held, not because the police were there in time. Shocking, shameful, or to put it in with, a, or to use a German word that's also a Yiddish word, it was a Schande. And there are a couple things that, are, that went wrong here. One, I think, is that in the last 30 years in East Germany, the state was in retreat and did not watch over the radicalization of certain sectors of the population. Now, those of you who are interested in this kind of topic may, have, may know that there were neo-Nazi groups even in the GDR. This is not generally known. But that's one of the reasons why, after 1990, there were very quickly, there was a right-wing right radical mobilization of neo-Nazi groups. You remember the incidents of Rostock, Lichtenhagen, and of Hoyerswerda. Uh, younger East German writers have written at length about how these groups developed and basically started occupying public spaces after 1990. And I have to say, I think we, we Germans, but also the West German policymakers who occupied positions in East Germany, really have to blame ourselves for looking away and not for coming down with the full force of the law on these milieus hard enough and early enough. And, it is, and we're paying the price for that right now in terms of votes for the AfD. The last regional elections in, in Germany in, on September 1 in Brandenburg and Sax Saxony saw a quarter of the voters, 25 and 27% voting for the AfD at a time when the AfD has become radicalized in ways that make it fully visible what manner of party it is. And so, you know, I, 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 I think it's a little hard to say now, at this point in Germany, that people who vote for Nazis aren't Nazis themselves. At the very least, they are in denial about whom they are voting for, and they shouldn't be. They have no excuse anymore. But I also blame representative policies, uh, representative democracy and its institutions and policymakers and politicians who looked away for far too long. Sorry, I'm going on too long here, but um, the point I, I, I want to make is that these phenomena are surely not unfamiliar to many of you who come from other countries, from Estonia, from Latvia here, from Lithuania, from Poland, from wherever you've come from. We all share similar, shall we say, weaknesses of representative democracy. And I think before we look at the populace, before we blame the voters, we would, before we blame Russian interference, we would do very well to see, to, look, to take a close, hard and self-critical look at the things that we have been in denial about. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nuanced uh, presentation uh, and these careful distinctions that we all do need to make. Uh, and I think uh, the uh, phrase that you said that uh, there are people that are in denial about who they uh, are voting for is something that can be applied to many different countries. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, before um, I open up uh, uh, the uh, floor to questions, uh, do any of our panelists want to respond to what one of the other panelists said? Yeah, D Dr. Freiberg. I wouldn't wish to finish on a critical note. I'm Donald Tusk, who is a very nice man, <laughs> <laughs> and whom I know well. Uh, and what I, what I really would like to emphasize is that the whole concept of party which I didn't manage to address, is really under question as to what political parties represent. When you have a clear um, sort of bisection of the population, 
into the right and into the left, into the Democrats and uh, into the Republicans, uh, one gets the illusion uh, that the population is not totally homogeneous, but that it's neatly split in half uh, by those who uh, wish to support uh, productivity, uh, uh, GDP, uh, big business who produce it, uh, and uh, also a certain conservative aspect to maintaining the status quo. Uh, the left, then, is the one uh, that wants to introduce change, uh, who will wish uh, or claim uh, to represent the rest of the population, uh, and uh, as we see in, in the United States presidential elections, uh, the population then tends to have a pendulum movement, give the ones a chance for four or eight years, uh, and, and then discontent builds up to a critical level, and then you give the others a chance for another four or eight years, and the pendulum swings back and forth, and everybody gets their chance. However, populations are, and we do in many countries, why, what the reason why uh, governments are difficult to form is because uh, there seems to be a split. Brexit came awfully close. Um, the referendum in, in Quebec about Quebec independence some decades back uh, came rather close between the yeses and the noes, and so on it goes. Um, but populations simply are not bisected in half into right and left. Populations are multi-layered. Uh, they are multifaceted. They represent the different interests. And these interests are not always clearly formulated or clearly understood either by the population or by those who claim to lead it or wish to lead it. In other words, those who enter politics. And the very complexity of the modern world has required, I think, a deep rethinking of how parties are formed, how their policies are formulated, and uh, whom it is that they wish and claim to represent. Uh, and th this requires work from think tanks, from intellectuals, uh, from those with political experience, uh, from the old, from the young, um, uh, uh, and from all, all sides of, of the political spectrum. Um, when I was president, I was faced, for instance, about uh, the, with having the right of veto on, on, on bills passed by parliament. I was asked by two different groups to either reject or, or sign uh, a bill accepted by parliament. And what was the issue? Uh, the issue was about the rights of commercial fishing in inland waters. And there were two clearly opposite groups. Uh, there were those who lived around inland waters and who made money uh, from fishing uh, there and, and selling the fish uh, on the market. And the other group was by people who did not make their living from inland fishing, uh, but who liked to indulge in, um, in fishing as a hobby, and, and therefore wished to have uh, the, the inland waters as rich in, uh, in fish as possible. Um, both of them had their interests at heart, uh, and the interests uh, simply uh, did not lead to the same result. Yesterday, Prime Minister Courage, I think, uh, presented to us in an extremely clear way how the European functions, European Union functions, and how democracy functions. You do have in populations conflicting interests or conflicting points of view, simply by the nature of things, not by ill will, uh, not by any perversity uh, in human nature, although God knows there's plenty of that around as well, uh, but, but simply by the reality of things and democratic policies, therefore, and, and, and the working both of civil services and governments uh, should be uh, being busy uh, trying to bridge the gap between different interests and, and trying to calculate the common good. And so societies are getting so multi-layered and so complex that I, I, I sort of have this 
this vision of, of a day coming when it's going to be an artificial intelligence program uh, that's going to balance all these various interests and politicians will simply become superfluous and obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, well, just briefly, I, uh, I think it's important to stress that there are Many, we are now discussing, an, in a very general sense, trends uh, uh, roughly around all, all the Western world or all, uh, the entire free world. I think there are many differences between the various countries and, and also between the various new parties that have emerged throughout the West. So, uh, just as a kind of, uh, uh, I think that is important to keep in mind when you analyze this. Uh, there can, of course, be uh, a more abstract debate as well, uh, but I would say, uh, just to, to a slightly different perspective, it, it can, in a democracy, not be seen per se as a problem that parties come and go. Uh, it is, of course, also a kind of, uh, could be a, a, a natural part of a democracy that some parties uh, are no longer perceived as relevant and others emerge in, instead because of changes in society, for instance, or that new issues uh, arise and are per perceived as important. I mean, um, in the 1980s, we saw green parties emerging in, in many Western democracies because of a new interest in, in environmental issues. And we have now seen that migration has become an important issue in many countries, which has prom uh, contributed in, in prompting new parties to arise. So. Uh, and, and I would say that those tensions in the population which, which this illustrates that new parties may emerge can either be uh, between parties or within parties depending on the electoral system. If you have an electoral system like in America or the United Kingdom where you have uh, very strong uh, bias for having a two-party system, then you have these tensions within the parties. Uh, in a proportional election system, it's more likely that new parties can, can get in, gain enough support and enter parliament. Uh, and then you may have, have those, uh, those conflicts between parties instead. And I think that is also an important perspective, although in, uh, even in countries without new parties, you, I think in many cases you have the same tensions, but they are not articulated in the same way. Uh, thank you for this comment, Speaker Norland. Uh, coming from a country which has at least two very stable and uh, historically long-term parties, uh, I think we here in Latvia, where each election cycle seems to bring at least five or six new parties, uh, can only envy you and your invitation to have more and more new parties. Uh, <laughs> so please, um, all of these very interesting presentations have certainly elicited uh, the desire for questions. So please, I will take two or three questions and please state who you are and say if you are addressing a specific person or the entire, uh, the entire panel. Uh, the gentleman in the red jacket there and way in the back uh, with the black jacket, uh, first of all. Yeah? And, uh, and there. So one, two, three. Yeah? Thank you. Hello. I'm Philip from Germany. and. I'm an undergraduate student, and I'd like to ask a maybe a bit provocative question. Um, Kevin Kühnert, the head of the Young Social, Social Socialist Union in Germany, has said once that we can blame this sort of on the capitalist system, in quotes. And he said, after the capitalist system had lost its rival in the communist system, it had to pretend that it was sort of equally concerned with the welfare of its citizens. Now that that, let's say, challenger is gone, all the pretense is gone, and now you can see the capitalism in its full might. We don't have to care about others, it's just about profit. And so my question would be how much can we blame liberalism and, or neoliberalism and the capitalist system for the crisis that we've discussed? Thank you. I, I would like anybody who feels qualified to answer, please okay. answer. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay please. Thank you, uh, Commander England, Belgian Defence Staff. Um, uh, the media bears a part of responsibility in the oversimplification of the meaning of democracy. The democracy has been reduced to the fact of winning a democratic election, 
And I would argue that winning a democratic election makes you a Democrat exactly as much as eating carrots makes you a rabbit. <laughs> so my question is, shouldn't we urgently re-educate the people as to the true meaning of democracy and uh, its other components such as uh, the rule of law as opposed to the rule by law? to make them, to force the people to analyze political programs before they cast their votes. Good, good question. And the last third question to the... Thank you very much. My name is Rahel Köhler. I'm from Germany. Uh, my question is uh, for Madame Stelzenmüller. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to say that I'm as terrified and concerned about the situation in Germany as you are. Uh, well, maybe, however, I don't, I, I wouldn't say that I think that everyone who votes uh, the AFD is a neo-Nazi. Um, anyways, uh, uh, my, my question for you is, what do you think, how uh, would it be possible to contain the influence of the AFD and what could be done in order for the current situation not to become the status quo? Because even though maybe most of the voters might not be neo-Nazis, it's still, it has a lot of potential for radicalization, yes? So yeah, this is my question, sure. thank you. Yes, let's start with the precise question, and yeah, then sure. the other two that were addressed to everybody will address afterwards. Absolutely, okay. Uh, those are very good questions. Um, How to contain the FD? The thing I would start with, frankly, is, um, uh, and I wish pe more people would do that, is to read, not just look at AFD videos or AFD social media feeds, which are distressing enough, but just read their party program or read their military strategy for those of you who are interested in that kind of thing. The party program of the AFD is on its website in German, English, and Russian and Hungarian, by the way which I think tells you something. <laughs> um, and it is quite clear in calling the current constitutional order of Germany an illegitimate system. As far as I'm concerned, um, that is a reason not to vote for them. If you want to go farther, you can go and look for their military strategy paper, which they published in the summer, and which, among other, many other interesting points, says the Bundeswehr needs to fight, learn to fight mercilessly again. As a member of the Beirat of Inre Führung, which is a civilian advisory council for the Bundeswehr, I'm hoping that that never happens. Um, so I think one, one response to your question is educate ourselves about what these people actually want. And being Germans, they put it in writing and they put it on websites. Um, so we don't really have an excuse not to know what they want. The other thing that, of course, the AFD and other populist parties want is power. They want power, and when they are in power, they tell us, and they tell us in writing, that they want to change the system. And the system that they consider illegitimate is representative democracy, is separation of powers, is limited government, is political pluralism, and the protection of minorities against the tyranny of the majority. And the path to power, of course, is coalitions coalitions with the conservatives, that would be the natural partner, but there are also people who think, who can see a, what used to be in the 1920s and early 1930s was called a querfront, in other words, a coalition between the hard left and the hard right, and there are publications in Germany, like Compact Magazine and others, who advocate exactly that. But the that notwithstanding, there is no real political movement underfoot between the extreme left and the extreme right, at least in Germany, to coalesce. So the responsibility is very much, unfortunately, with Chancellor Merkel's Christian Democrats. And some of you who follow this kind of thing will have seen that there is a, an internal fight between the right wing, a, or a quantitatively relatively small right wing of the CDU, which calls itself the Values Union, the Werte Union, about whether to enter into coalitions on the local, regional, or national level. 
So far, Christy Christian Schmidt's shaking his head at me. But Christian, it is, Christian, it is, I'm, I'm sorry, but as you know, it is going on. Um, it, you, I mean, both of us think that these people, but that's another story. You can say it's not relevant, you can say it's not relevant, but here, here is the point, Christian. The fact, the fact that it's even happening, the fact that the AFD, in the way that they push these debates, are changing what sociologists call the Overton window, the Overton window, for those of you who haven't heard the term, is the window, of the, the, the frame, as it were, of language that becomes acceptable, topics that become acceptable. It used to be unthinkable to even discuss this kind of thing. It has now become discussable. That is an important change, even though the AFD is not in power. I mean, it's in all the 16 state legislatures, mm. but it's not in the executive. That's the kind of thing I mean. Yeah, you may say it's quantitatively not relevant, it's not going to happen. I, I agree with you, I believe that. Nonetheless, they are succeeding in shaping the debate, and we need to be very vigilant about that. Okay. Yeah. And that's the, 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 this, is where we, this is where we are. I think that, um, one final point, sure. if I may, I think that we, I, I think the approach to dealing with all this has to be uh, two-pronged. I think the, the state, and by which I mean the executive state, the domestic intelligence services, the police, and, 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 and local and regional governments can do a great deal more to crack down on the extreme right, the actual neo-Nazis. They must never be allowed to occupy public spaces as they did in demonstrations in Chemnitz and in Dortmund. That must never happen again. Yeah. Synagogues need to be protected on Yom Kippur. It is inexcusable for there not to be police protection of synagogues and indeed of mosques on holy days or other days. But the other thing is, I think that politicians, and some of you have said this before, is, is, is that politicians do also need to prove to voters and to prove to publics and citizens that democracy, that representative democracy and its institutions work. They need to prove, and, and the onus of responsibility is on them to prove that, that they can do the work of governance effectively. And I think we can all think of examples where that's not happening. Yeah. And this leads us very nicely into one of the questions, uh, which was about democracy uh, and whether democracy is just elections or whether it is a full-blown uh, operation uh, with, uh, of, of course, an accent on education. Uh, anybody want to continue, uh, please, Speaker Nolan? Well, I, I think it's uh, very important to have a continued uh, or uh, ever continuing dialogue mm -hmm. with, peop uh, with the population about democracy. I, we have a, a democracy jubilee going on in Sweden, celebrating 100 years of Swedish democracy during uh, between 2018 and 2022. And one important part of that is that I and the deputy speakers travel around the country and have hold seminars and lectures and meet not least young people and discuss democracy. and why democracy by both morally and practically is superior to any other form of government you might imagine. Uh, so I think that is uh, truly a very important thing to do. But I also agree that uh, it's also important to show that democracy delivers uh, and to, to relate to the, the issue about the capitalist system. Uh, I would say that um, uh, my, my, uh, my impression or my, my opinion is that in the West uh, there, have, there was for rather a long time ago a reconciliation between uh, left and right when it comes to the uh, principles of the welfare states. Mm -hmm. Because I think in, in all Western democracies there is a welfare state of some sort. They can be technically quite different, uh, but there is a broad cons there have been for long been a broad consensus that there should be uh, various social services av available for the population uh, funded in one way or the other by, by public funds. And so I, I really don't see that we have uh, pure capitalist systems uh, in our countries. And 
I can't see anyone actually advocating that really, either from left or from right. And uh, so, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't agree with that conflict or that problem that was presented. I would say that uh, we are still in in several countries in Europe dealing with the aftermath of the mm -hmm. uh, terrible uh, 50, 40, 50 years of of communist dictatorships and communist economic policies uh, in Europe. And uh, that the answer, it, it is very good that that is gone. And that that conflict really didn't produce anything of value uh, because it left those countries with scars that will take generations to heal uh, and that those scars are are among the driving forces of the trends that we are currently discussing at least in some countries uh, before we take the next uh, round would anybody else like to respond to either the democracy issue or the acute uh, liberalism leading madam populism? chairman yes? we have a question we have not answered and that yes. is a gentleman there addressed the, the problem exactly. of what we mean by liberal democracy or liberalism. Mm -hmm. First of all, he, he made a contrast between um, uh, the, what capitalism delivers and what it claims to deliver. I think uh, what it does deliver became very clear uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, simply comparing the physical conditions in which the uh, average citizen lived in the West and in the east of the Iron Curtain uh, was, was too obvious for words. With the exception of the nomenclatura, the people under communism lived in uh, infinitely worse uh, conditions and quality of life than in the West, and that's a simple fact. But about liberalism, you see, we have had uh, a development of liberalism, which also has accelerated during the 20th century and continues to accelerate today. Uh, when we used to think about liberalism, these were uh, progressive ideas, humanistic progressive ideas, which very slowly and very painfully and with great difficulty took root uh, in um, Western civilization in Europe as in America. Think of the fight that Wilber first had to do uh, in the British Parliament until he convinced his colleagues in the Parliament that slavery was wrong and should be made illegal. It was a terribly difficult fight. Uh, think of Florence Nightingale when she said that uh, the profession of nursing should not be left to camp followers and prostitutes who uh, um, treated wounded soldiers after battles, but that the profession of nursing such uh, which they instituted in the, in the, during the Crimean War, uh, should be created. Or Henri Dunant, who went even further and said the Red Cross should be allowed to enter uh, b battlefields and, and, and pick up wounded, regardless of what kind of uniform they wore. These are examples of progressive humanism, uh, uh, which have formed what we considered liberal thought. In other words, even Protestantism and the idea that every uh, uh, believer should be entitled to read the Bible and possibly arrive to individual uh, interpretations of passages uh, created the religious wars in Europe and, and fantastic conflict. The whole idea that simply the, and universities, that professors in universities should be allowed to actually express their own opinions and do their own research rather than recopy or repeat Aristotle or, or some other antique uh, authority. But in the 1930s and in the post-war period, um, the intellectuals of Europe and partly also of the United States were actually seduced by totalitarian ideologies. There are writings of French poets which are simply hair-raising, we're talking about hair-raising things here. Uh, read some of the writings of French poets in the 1930s, half of whom adore th Stalin and Stalinism, and the other half who are equally thrilled about Hitler and seduced by what he is offering. It is totally blood-chilling to see intellectuals coming from the highest schools and having the highest IQs expressing views of that nature. But then you have people like Roland Barthes, such a respected, uh, super intellectual uh, uh, of the French intellectual elite. And I, I like the quote of his where he says, what does a convinced Marxist who is a French intellectual do to harm bourgeois Western society and its values? Uh, he tries to destroy them from within, 
by distorting and perverting, I'm not quoting verbatim, uh, the, what they represent, and I think this is where we started, deconstructionism. Uh, there we started having anti-intellectualism, even by the intellectuals. Uh, beauty in art uh, became a no-no. Um, having um, produ painters producing uh, raw innards and, and, and bleeding stumps uh, was the thing rather than what art used to be in Europe. Uh, I remember um, a particular uh, exhibition where uh, uh, in an open tin can a pile of excrement was presented as a work of art. Uh, and I think that this, this would answer very well to what Bart had in mind. In other words, you simply pervert, you, you, you degrade, uh, you destroy uh, what bourgeois uh, Western culture had been trying to build up of the centuries. And I would say that uh, they have succeeded rather well, and they continue uh, to be. And it's not just, the, uh, I think that when you said the right wing and the left wing extremists join themselves like in a color circle, uh, as brothers under the skin, uh, we have to think uh, of, of these uh, deep convictions that in many ways have destruction of civilization and society as their actually explicit aim, just as much as do religious uh, extremists, whose sole aim is to actually kill anybody who doesn't believe the same as they. Uh, you know, sir, you asked about the democracy. Well, no doubt the democracy is not perfect and life, life is not perfect. But what alternative we have? The only alternative we have is dictatorship and autocracy. Look at Russia. Look at other regimes. If we fail to preserve and to defend democracy in the free world, the world will shift to dictatorship and to the dark times. In terms of capitalism, well, in my humble opinion, capitalism is not just an economic definition. It's far from being just economy. It comprises both economy and politics. Because what capitalism is really about? Strong institutions. That's what populists want to undermine. Capitalist, uh, capitalism is about justice, law and order, free trade, um, strong democratic institutions, um, transparent financial sector, competitiveness and, and strong competition. Fighting corruption. Absolutely, and this is, this, it's all about strong institutions. Mm -hmm. Justice, persecution. So, again, what kind of alternative we have? Maybe there is something on the table. No. No doubt that we need to upgrade this. And, for example, a few days ago, I read in The Economist uh, that in Belgium, the city, a very small city, UPenn, uh, decided, right, this is, this is a German-speaking city, mainly populated by the Germans in Belgium. Okay. So they decided to <laughs> choose, could you imagine what? A new city council, by what means? By lottery. And this, it, it's like an advisory city council in UPenn has an oversight powers over the local parliament. So in this way, they decided to upgrade democracy. Well, this could be a good trial. I'm not sure about this. Maybe it's better to change the electoral law rather than to uh, uh, have lottery on uh, who is to be elected to the city council. <laughs> but here is the thing. That's definitely we need to upgrade to, to make our democracy more efficient, I would say in order to convince the people that this is the right way to move and this is, this is the right way to support because the democracy changed their life. Not negatively, but positively. Hard job, hard toil, but this is the job of the politicians. So I am for democracy and I am for capitalism. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, our screen there is, has been showing three big black 
uh, zeros for some time now. Uh, so I have to ask Mr. Bauman, is, do we have time for one or two questions or not? Lunch. We could, so one or two more questions, uh, Mr. Laing and uh, the lady here. So two more questions. Uh-oh, uh people are already <laughs> leaving. Uh, uh, I would like to challenge you with uh, the moderator. Oh, okay, <coughs> please. 20 years ago, I left Sweden to return to Latvia. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Speaker, if I were to return today, would I recognize the Sweden I left? I exaggerate, but still. And look, let's be honest. We did talk about identity. I think everybody mentioned it, and also culture. Uh, let me be the devil's advocate. If you did not have the mass of people coming from the south in one year, one, oh, over a million in Germany and over 100,000 in Sweden, would you have these new parties that you talked about? Okay, okay so the question is, uh, are the new parties, the populist parties, a direct result of migration? One more question? I'd like to take that. Yeah, okay, you'll take that, I'm sure. Any more questions? Any more? Can maybe we? Maybe you can start answering. Right. I think okay. that would be best. Delanes, um, it's certainly true that the refugee crisis of 2015 helped the AfD morph into from a sort of a party of Eurosceptic professors of uh, political econ uh, economy that was getting five to six percent of the vote into a completely different and much more aggressive animal. That's true. But I think that it's interesting and it's, it's important to realize that the AFD gets its highest votes in areas that have almost no refugees whatsoever, you know, particularly in Eastern Germany. Most of the refugees landed in Bavaria, where Mr. Schmidt is from, or in other, in other parts of Western Germany, uh, the larger, more populous, and richer regional states. So I think to, to blame all this on immigration is dangerous because it blames the other for structures that are much older. Again, I said earlier that the GDR had actual neo-Nazi movements. And if you ask sociologists about them, the, the, the hierarchy of the MFS, of the, in other words, of the Stasi, uh, was seeing its sons enter and, be, and play key roles in these neo-Nazi movements before 1989. So, uh, you know, there is, and on the other hand, in Western Germany, the, the Neue Deutsche Rechte, the new German right, goes back well into the 1960s and has roots and has had excellent relations with the French Nouvelle Droite well before anybody ever thought of the AFD. And when the NPD, the actual neo-Nazi party of the 60s and 70s, was, you know, never got, never got past the parliamentary threshold of 5%. So the intellectual and organizational roots of these movements, at least in my country, are older, better organized, and less connected to the IFD than you'd think. In fact, for many of them, I think the IFD is just the infantry that they were looking for. Yeah. Yes. So you have to be, you, you have to be particular. And, and the other thing that I would like to say is that while, while these million people that came, you know, posed a serious problem for, for civil society and the civil service in Germany, I, and while there are still problems, I think that we've actually managed to integrate the bulk of these new arrivals fairly well. The, the biggest remaining problem are the people who, who, who have been determined not to have a right to asylum and whom it is hard to send back because they have somewhat understandably perhaps destroyed their passports or because their countries of origin refuse to acknowledge their citizenship. You know, that's, that's, but that's a, that's a really complicated legal and administrative problem that we haven't resolved yet and that is likely to stay with us. But on the whole, I think that we managed to absorb this influx of refugees relatively well. Mm -hmm. 
Speaker Norlin, on this same issue. Well, uh, since the question was directed to me, would, I, would you recognize Sweden uh, if you came back now 20 years later? Yes, you would. Uh, Sweden is, in many respects, the same country as it was 20 years ago. It, it's still a stable democracy with stable institutions and um, uh, with a uh, thriving business community, good growth. Uh, beautiful nature, well, I could go on uh, and with a Swede Sweden promotion, but uh, <laughs> I, I, in many respects, uh, I would say that a country doesn't change fundamentally in, in, in a decade or two, and neither has Sweden. Of course, Sweden has changed. There are always changes in societies. And yes, we have had uh, immigration uh, to Sweden. We had immigration, uh, if you left 1999, we had immigration before then. We had many refugees from the Balkan Wars, for instance, and previously uh, immigrants from, from Yugoslavia and other countries who came to Sweden to work, uh, and so on. So yes, there have always been changes in society, but the basic structures, I would say, remain the same. Having said that, of course, we have challenges with integration, uh, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I think migration, integration is only one part of the explanation for, for these trends in politics in Sweden and in other countries, because, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my uh, opening intervention, uh, if you look at the polls, there have been criticism in, in, uh, among segments of the Swedish population against migration uh, for 20 years or perhaps even more, uh, but no one has articulated that. Uh, of the pol no one, no one of the political parties articulated that or tried to play to that sentiment. And um, so I would say that uh, the, uh, there are many complicated reasons for this development of new parties in Sweden and, and in other countries. Thank you for these specific answers to a very specific, uh, specific question. One last question. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Liana and I'm a student from Latvia. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for this productive discussions, but you uh, mainly focus on like uh, local problems in uh, terms of populism. But uh, populism tends to focus on the black or the white perspectives of things, forgetting the details and the gray areas. So do you think uh, the populism also poses a threat to international affairs like the strength of NATO and European Union. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we've touched on several aspects of this question already. Uh, anybody else want to add anything yeah. to what we've uh, already ab said? Absolutely. Look, Rus Russian, Russian government heavily supports all populistic movements in the European Union. Yeah. Russian government and Russian information machine heavily supports pro -po populistic parties in the European Union. Uh, the reason is very simple. They want to split the union. They want to undermine the unity, transatlantic unity. And uh, they buy politicians, they buy political parties, they buy media outlets, they buy NGOs. This is a new type of hyper political war against the free world. So on the one hand, you're absolutely right saying that this is a domestic issue. It's no longer a domestic issue. Look what's happening in the entire world. Isolationism, nationalism, all these stuff supported by populists. And populists are supported by dictators like Putin and Russia. Okay, the only uh, conclusion that I can hope to draw is that this is an ongoing discussion. And if uh, after the European elections in May of this year, we thought that we could just draw a big sigh of uh, relief and this issue would no longer be such a hot potato as it had been leading up to the European elections. I think, as we have seen today with these illustrious panelists, it is certainly uh, an issue that will pursue us in the years to come and not only before European elections. So let's give a huge hand to our really very, very good panelists today.